ready? Sure. Okay, let's go. And the more you bring value to other people, the more valuable you become. Don't get what they want is because they don't focus on what they want. They focus on what they're afraid of and what they don't have. So this is my dog Spot. He's only two pounds. But when he grabs onto a chew toy, he is not letting go. His full name is Spoticus. He's a warrior. Now the other night, the other night, I look over playing with him and he literally fell asleep with the chew toy in his mouth. Are you hanging on to your dream that tightly? You gotta imagine that it's possible so that it can become possible. Trying to get into a lane in traffic and you get it scoot up an inch and then they scoot up an inch and they won't let you in, instead of rolling down the window and letting them know they're number one, instead, you know what you do? You just look over at them and smile. <laughs> it's important that we become aware that what you put out there comes back. There's an ancient phrase that says, you don't see the world as it is, you see the world as you are. Be on a course, so over the next 27 years, I decided I had to figure out how to train your brain to prepare you, not scare you. And so I'm here to share three strategies with you that are going to show you how to train your brain for success. Number one, focus on the outcome that you want. Your mind is like a GPS. You type in the destination you want to go, and it takes you there. The number one reason people don't get what they want is because, one, they don't know what they want, or two, they focus all their time on what they don't want and what they're afraid of, and what they think might happen that they don't like. And wherever your attention goes, that's where your energy flows. So if you're focusing on what you don't want, guess what you get more of? So pay attention to the words you use when you're talking to yourself. For the parents in here, if you tell your child, don't throw that toy, what do they do? They throw the toy. Because your brain doesn't hear the word don't, it hears what comes after it. People will say, I can't stop eating. I don't know why. I'm having a hard time losing weight. I tell myself all day long, don't eat the cookies. Don't eat the cookies. You know what your mind hears? Eat the cookies. And right here. Good. All right. Show me motivation again. <laughs> Alvin Toffler in a book once said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who can no longer read or write, but those who are unable to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Your mission, the best way to get other people to do the things that you want to do is help them to feel like they're making a contribution, help them feel significant, help them feel like they are co-creating something. Because people support what they co-create. We have to cause something inside of us that says, you know what, it's time to play to win. Most people play not to lose. You might be playing not to lose, and you have to shift that. Because when you feel calm and secure inside, and you know that you're okay, it allows you to take pressure off and fully make it about other people for real. Because we get so caught up in what's going on inside of us, we lose the ability to notice what's going on around us. And then as a result, because we're sorting by ourselves instead of by others. And instead of looking at the bigger picture, we get caught up in the details of the moment. Instead of focusing on it's gonna be okay, we're focusing on why it isn't. Because of that, we feel stressed and we get stuck. And then our mind shuts down instead of being resourceful. And everyone in here is resourceful and brilliant. That's why you are in here. You ready? One, two, three. Ah! Don't become a victim. Stay out of your head. 
All arguments start because somebody says something and then you go in your head and you start to feel like you were uh, taken advantage of or somehow you have been wounded and you have to attack back. You feel attacked yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah. Right? so you have to right. attack back to defend yourself or prove yourself or you just sh shut down and walk away, which causes the other person to get bigger and larger and come after you. Okay. Yeah, so don't become a victim in your head. Don't do that. No. Okay. So again, how are you going to interpret your situations in life? There's a little boy. He's in elementary school. It's lunchtime. He has his tray. He's got his food. He's walking the table. He trips. Boom! His food crashes everywhere. Everybody in the lunchroom starts laughing and pointing. Ah! They're all clapping for him. The little boy grabs his food, stands up, starts crying, and runs out of the lunchroom. Second period lunch. Another little boy comes into the lunchroom. He's getting all his stuff. He's walking in. He trips. Oh! Boom! Everything goes flying. Pizza burger here, chocolate milk, tater tots. Stuff to keep you awake for second half of school. Okay? Everybody goes, ah! And they're laughing and laughing, ah! And they're laughing and laughing. The boy grabs up his food. He grabs his tray. He says, thank you. I'll be here all week. And then he goes and sits down. Which one are you going to be when you trip and fall? Okay, so I hope this works because you're a big guy. Okay. <laughs> you seem small over there. <laughs> okay. All right, so here's what we're going to do, okay? I want you to go ahead and I want you to um, take an arm, either arm, this one I guess, and make a fist and put it right in front of you. Good. Now I'm going to take two fingers and I'm going to push this arm down and I want you to resist. Yes, he's very strong. Okay, great. All right, so here's what we're going to do now. We're going to play this little game and see what happens, okay? So, I want you to go ahead and I want you to put that hand out there again. Now, I want you to think about that fear. See everything going down. Now, I want everybody out there to go, uh, ready? Uh, and feel that fear. <laughs> now, I want you to go, I believe! Do it. I believe. Stronger, I believe!
<laughs> Anybody feeling stressed at the moment? No! Because I'm scrambling your recipe! Your brain's going, huh, what, who, what? Notice, I didn't tell you to change what you were saying ever once. I didn't tell you to change what you were focusing on ever once. I just showed you a couple little tricks to break the pattern. Okay? If an object is always going in the same direction, it's going to keep going in the same direction unless some other force knocks it out of the way. You be the force. Don't wait for somebody else to be the force in your life. You be the force. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if you are looking to not just build a career but build a life, you've got to see the opportunities that are around you all the time. The opportunities that are in this room that are much more meaningful and not as superficial as what typically happens, where you are authentically connecting with people, getting to know what's going on, making that person feel like they are a star when they're in your presence. That causes business. Are you the cause in your life or are you the effect? So there's this woman and she had a $250,000 job, high profile position and she needed filled and there was two candidates and they were both equally good. And so she had a dinner party that night and she sat down between the two. And so she turned to the one person and she had this great conversation with them and, and they were talking and laughing and, and this guy was telling her about all the places he had traveled to and all the things that he had done and all the cool experiences that he had. And by the end of that night, she was convinced that he was the most amazing person she had ever met. Then she turns and has another conversation. And as she's talking to this gentleman, he's asking her all about how long she's been with the company and what she's done and the experiences, and they're laughing and they're having a good time. And at the end of the conversation, she's convinced that she's the most amazing person she has ever met. Now, who do you think she hired? Well, you're connecting more effectively with people and it causes them to feel good about you. And when people feel good about you, they want to help you. So whether it's at work and you have employees that are getting along more effectively or at home with your relationships or just out and about, being charming has its advantages. And this is about more than just being nice to other people and, and complimenting him. What are some of the, the, the tips that you offer professionally? Yeah, there are some specific strategies for increasing your charm factor. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing is be glad when you meet somebody. Actually show them and demonstrate that you're happy to see them. So you would lean forward, make eye contact, smile, go, hey, how are you? Okay, because, yeah, you're good, that's right. And see how you perk up because... Kind of thing. Missing your baby is completely different from, you know, everybody died. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got the wrong person, so she's like, I don't care about dying. one reason why people procrastinate is because they've associated pain to the goal and so we push it aside. So we want to make sure that we're aware of what we're saying to ourselves. I had a client Virginia and she wanted me to help her lose weight and so uh, I li was listening to her over talk you know over um, listening to her conversation and she was explaining to her friends that she was just the best with her southern cooking her fried chicken and her biscuits and gravy and her friends were just their mouth was watering and I said, hey, Ginny, tell me about your healthy food. And she goes, what, rabbit food? Like salad and celery? And I said, the problem is that you're associating pain to the stuff that'll get you thinner. You gotta switch your strategy. She looked at me like I had two heads, but she came back three weeks later and she's all smiles. I said, Ginny, why are you smiling? She says, I'm down seven pounds. And I said, what have you been doing? She says, let me tell you about my Hawaiian buffet. I get my wooden bowls. I get my greens from the garden, my little goodies, my glass of water with a slice of uh, sunshine on there with my lemon. I feel like I'm on vacation. And I said, well, what about your fried chicken? And she says, oh, that makes me feel greasy. See, she changed her strategy. She changed the way she trained her brain. On your back, like Les Brown says. If you can land on your back, you can see up. If you can see up, you can get up. Hallelujah. Okay? <laughs> So we want to make sure that we are having faith in what we want. So there's this gentleman, you might have heard of him, named Walt Disney. And Walt had this dream, he had this faith, he had this idea that he wanted to create this place where you could kind of go around the world in one place. Everybody thought he was nuts, but he believed it. Now unfortunately, he passed away about a month before Epcot finally opened. And a reporter was there on opening day with Roy Disney, Walt's brother. And he looked over at Roy and he said, you know, it's a shame that Walt wasn't here to see this. And Roy just smiled at the reporter and he says, you know, Walt was the first one to see this and that's why we're here today.
Instead of focusing on the outcome we want, we get lost in the details of what's happening in the moment. That's like driving like this. Yeah, but Tim, you got to know where you're at. Yes, you do. But did you drive here like this? This is where I'm at. No, you look forward, right? You have to be looking at the bigger picture. The details are important, but you have to know where you're going. A lot of people drive like this. They drive living in the past. When you get in your car to go home this evening, look at the rear view mirror and then look at the windshield and then notice every time you get in the car that the reason that your windshield is so much bigger than your rear view mirror is because where you're headed is way more important than where you've been. I want you to pick one of those. Pick the blame. This side, do the, um, the placator where you're like this. And this side of the room, do the blamer where you're pointing over at them. And this side over here, you do the distractor. And that side over there, you guys do the, the um, computer. Okay, and we'll do it all together and, at once and then everybody look at each other. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, go. Yes, good. Welcome to corporate America. I'm having a really hard time getting out of this hole. I'm confused and I'm frustrated and I'm scared and this sucks and I want out. She finally makes her way out of the hole and she keeps on going. Day two. I'm walking down the same street. I fall into the hole again. I cannot believe that I am here again. And I know that it's not my fault. Who put this hole here? What idiot did that? This should be fixed. This is not my fault that I'm here. And she has an even harder time getting out of the hole. But she finally does, and she keeps on going. Day three, she's walking down the same street. She sees the hole. She tries to go around it, but falls in again. It's a habit now. She's like, oh my gosh. I cannot believe this is happening again. But then she has this idea. Maybe it is me. Maybe there's something I am doing. And she gets out of the hole right away. Keeps on going. Day four. She's walking down the street. She sees the hole. She recognizes it. She takes responsibility. She gets all the way around it. She keeps on going. And on day five, she takes a different street. <laughs> So where are you at in your journey right now? Okay, about what is your dream? That causes you to go into vision so that you're focusing on what's possible instead of what is. Intelligence is understanding what is. Genius is understanding what could be. And if you focus on that, you will start to move towards it. You can change the way you feel about anything. It's not what happens. It's how you interpret it that matters more than anything else. So I kept getting angry about everything and then of course I'd fly off the handle and then end up creating more things, more problems, more stress because that's where I was coming from. What you put out into the world gets mirrored back. It reminds me of this little fly. This fly is flying around, really hungry, sees a farm over there, sees a nice pile of cow poo, goes over there, lands on the cow poo. Okay? Eats. Mm -mm. Eats. Eats. Mm, this is so good. Eats so much that the fly tries to get up and fly away and can't. Tries again and it can't. It ate too much. Says, oh my goodness, how am I going to get out of here? And it looks over at this haystack and it sees a pitchfork and it looks at the handle and it says, if I climb all the way to the top and I jump off, I get a jump start and then I'll make it and I'll be able to get out of here. So he gets all the way to the pitchfork. And then he's climbing up the handle. He gets all the way to the top of the handle. And then he jumps off the pitchfork. Zoom, splat right on the ground. No more fly. What's the moral of the story? Never fly off the handle when you're full of crap. <laughs> Someone just went, oh, I got it. <laughs> you literally heard the light bulb go off. <laughs> we got to keep our word because it builds trust and we embrace feedback. Most people are afraid of feedback. How many people follow you around and give you feedback about how you're doing? And how many times do you go, good, I want to learn more? Most people are going, oh my gosh. 
Feedback can be really good because it allows you to see yourself through the eyes of another so you can get f more information about yourself that you don't already have. You cannot see the label when you're in the bottle. You can't be objective with yourself because the only information that you have to compare notes with is the stuff you already have in there. You're not getting any external information unless you connect with others through seminars, coaching, friendships, mentoring, some kind of process where you're getting feedback. Most people don't have that experience. It's un what you say to yourself in your head and what you hear around you affects you in dramatic ways, in ways that people would not even believe. Okay? So, now you're, wow, you're much bigger than I thought. Okay, this is going to be perfect. Come on over here real quick. Okay, so, hi, I'm Tim. Doug. Hi, Doug, nice to meet you. Okay, so, Doug's a nice, strong guy, right? So I want you to go ahead and put your hand out in front of you. Now I'm going to take my two wimpy fingers, and I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to push down on his arm, but I want you to think about something that makes you feel happy. Think about something that makes you feel happy. Okay. You got it? Okay. Okay, okay. think about that. Think about something else that makes you happy, too. A cold beer. A cold beer. All right. So I'm pushing down nice and strong. Good. Now I want you to think about something that um, makes you feel stressed. When was the last time you felt stressed out? Yesterday. Yesterday? All right. Get into that stress. Okay. Get into feeling it. The thing, the, the one thing that you tend to focus in on that got you the most upset. Okay. okay now keep that arm strong. <laughs> now. <laughs> When you are self-deceived, what you do is you start to make yourself better than you really are, and you start to make other people or other situations worse than they really are. And so I remember I was exhausted. So was my wife. She was passed out. So was I. Middle of the night, I hear my son crying. And it wakes me up, and instead of trusting that feeling to go do the right thing, instead, I entered my box of self-deception. Instead, I started to think, why isn't she getting up? What's wrong with her? Doesn't she hear her son? And then I started to go through the pattern. Gosh, what's wrong with her? She's probably sitting there faking sleeping. I made her worse, and of course she was passed out. I was the one faking sleeping. And then I started going into my own pity party. So I started thinking, well, geez, I've worked all day. I've got to get up early in the morning. I've got this seminar that I'm doing. You know, I'm a good dad. I'm a good father. I'm, I'm a good husband. I can't believe that I got to get up and do this. And I started making the situation worse. Now, in my mind, I was fully justified for doing that. But was I being a good dad in that moment? No. Was I being a good husband in that moment? No. I was overall a caring person, but it's so easy to slip into some of these patterns. And we want to be aware of them. And what drives us internally is the pain pleasure principle. Have you ever heard of that before? The pain pleasure principle. We are instinctively driven, hardwired, to avoid pain and to gain pleasure. Okay? So this is what happens when, when uh, we procrastinate. You decide, I need to make a phone call. I got to do some showings. I got to get things going. I got to make things happen. Okay? So you start thinking of all the things that you need to do and suddenly your mind starts saying to yourself, oh man, what if they say no? What if they don't show up? What if they reject me? You know, what if they don't accept me? And we start to say those fearful things to ourselves and of course that gives us that fearful feeling. So we start to feel pain. We start to get really uncomfortable. So what do we do? We start to say, well, you know what? Maybe I'll just do it tomorrow. And so we push it off till tomorrow, and guess what happens? Immediately, you feel better. Immediately, it's like, ah, suddenly you feel okay. And your brain makes an immediate neuro association, immediate connection that says, hey, if I just put this stuff off, I'll feel better. So guess what happens the next time you need to take action? Immediately, your brain at a subconscious level fires off this feeling of you saying, no, I don't want to do that, and then you don't. And then you literally condition yourself to continually procrastinate on the things that are going to make you successful. You say, oh, he makes me so mad. Oh, she drives me crazy. That is false. He doesn't make you mad. She doesn't drive you crazy. You are going into a reaction. You're choosing that. If I take this paper and I throw it and say, you made me do that, that's false. I made me do that. So we want to be aware of the stories we tell ourselves. It reminds me of the farmer that had all these horses. And 
One day he hears this ruckus and he goes outside and his neighbors there, they walk over and they see part of the fence is broken down and some of the farmer's best horses have run away. And the neighbors over there going, oh, that's bad. And the wise farmer says, well, how do you know? Later that afternoon, they hear another ruckus. They go back and all those horses had come back and they brought all these wild mares with them. Now the farmer's twice as wealthy and of course the neighbor's there and he goes, oh, that's good. And the farmer says, well... How do you know? The next day, the farmer's son is trying to tame one of these wild mares, and the horse bucks him off, and he breaks his leg. And of course, the neighbor's there. I don't know why this neighbor's always around. <laughs> they're your soulmates. Okay? They're, the, they're the ones that push you to show you what's inside of you. Okay? So he says, oh, no, that's bad. That's bad. And the farmer says, well, how do you know? Later that week, the army's coming through and taking all the sons off to this war. His son can't go because he's got a broken leg. And the neighbor says, oh, that's good. And the farmer says, well, how do you know? And it just goes on and on. So when something happens in your life, your spouse says something, something happens at work, you get in traffic, and your first response is to get upset, pause for a moment. Take a deep breath in through your nose and do the loosey-goosey, okay? And remind yourself that I can choose how I want to feel in this moment. There was four philanthropists, and they're in a village. And this army comes through the village and takes over and locks up all their warriors, all their best men, and throw them in these terrible prisons. So the first philanthropist says, I need to bring some magic here. I've got to do something better than this. This is not acceptable. I'm going to do something with the wealth I have. So he goes to the guards and he says, Guards, I have these big wells full of fresh, clean water, and you can have them all if you would just give our warriors fresh, clean water so that they don't get sick. And the guards said, Okay, we'll do that. And so those warriors had fresh, clean water in their prisons. And the philanthropist felt fulfilled. I have reached a higher calling. The second philanthropist saw that and said, well, I want to do something. So he goes to the guards and he says, guards, guards, I have fields full of food and you can have all of them if you would just feed our warriors so that they have something better to eat. And the guards said, fine. So they gave them food. So now the warriors had fresh, clean water and they had healthy food in their prisons. And that philanthropist thought, man, I have really, I was born to do this. The third philanthropist said, well, I want to contribute too. So he goes to the guards and he says, I have textile mills and I want you to give the guards, or I want you to give the, the prisoners pillows and blankets so that they're not laying on the ground on rocks so that they feel comfortable and they feel more relaxed in their prison. And so they said, fine. So they took all of that. And that third philanthropist really felt fulfilled. And the fourth philanthropist which was the wise one, the farmer in the bunch, says, you know what? I don't want them to be comfortable in their prisons. So that night, he buys off the guards, he finds out where they keep the keys, he gets a hold of the keys, he unlocks all the prison gates, and he sets the warriors free. The goal in life is not to tell yourself a story that makes you feel more comfortable in your mental prisons. The goal in your life is to recognize that you have the keys in your pocket, that all you have to do is pull them out. Unlock your mental prisons and set yourself free. Thank you very much. We've got the, uh, the website right there. Boom, right below me, timshirt.com. We've got the link to that on IndyStyle.tv. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.